All right, welcome everybody. We are on day five of our sort of mini boot camp rapid get started week. A large part of what we've tried to do so far in the I'm not sure if we call it a course yet because it really kicks off next week, but we've just wanted to give you a quick overview of what do you want to think about as teachers new to the online environment and what are some of the critical factors that you may find useful to reflect on and to try and integrate into your own teaching and learning practices. Uh, today we shift to assessment and evaluation. This is a tricky one, not because it's hard to do necessarily, but because it reflects so much of the things that we value in the education system. It reflects on the needs of coordinating our teaching practices to the education system. We, you know, we need to evaluate because that's how grades get assigned and we need to assess because that's the language of what goes on in the university and that's what our students expect and the list goes on. Now there's been a lot of discussion going on around should we just shift to exclusively pass fail this semester. There's been a few articles I've seen that have advocated for that. There are many others that have said, look, the way we assess in higher education is not effective as it is. We had a student panel on Wednesday that made it quite clear that there's a lot of issues with how they're being assessed when they're involved in online learning and the list goes on. So it's a pretty challenging topic. We do a much deeper dive on it later on in the course, but for the time being, at least, I just want to emphasize this is potentially a contentious space, a little bit of creativity is needed because there are issues of trust and assessment that, that are central to this. And in some regards, that's not new. Even in the ACAT, you know, within the university setting, we've had a long cycle of people questioning the value of how we're assessing our students. So on that note, today we have uh, Matt and Tanya, who are going to give us an overview of some of their thoughts regarding the assessment practices that you may wish to engage in online, or at least some of the concepts that you may wish to consider. So to kick off, I'm going to throw this over to Tanya, and I believe you should be able to share, but I'll just make sure I make you a, oh, did I mute you? I don't know what I did. I'm going to unmute you. I'm I'm going to Matt, did you want to go first, or do you, is that what you said? Yeah, I can go first, uh, fine, okay. or you want to. I know that you were just getting finished, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, no worries, fine. whatever. I will jump in. Let's see. Let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Yep, nice and clear, Matt. All right, there we go. So, hi, everyone. Um, Matt Crossland uh, with the Link Research Lab at the University of Texas Arlington. I've uh, been in instructional design for a uh, uh, decade and a half or so, a little bit more. Uh, also, um, uh, part-time faculty at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, where I teach in their master's and doctoral program for their online um, instructional design program that they have there as well. And so um, today, we are going to jump into the topic of assessment and evaluation. And uh, as we were talking about before the session started, Tanya and I did not get a chance to uh, talk about uh, what we were talking about. So we may cover some of the same ground. We may even contradict each other. That's okay because it's a, it's a very complex topic. Um, but we're going to go through some uh, basic ideas of assessment and evaluation. I'm going to touch on some kind of practical topics, that, uh, practical ways that I do assessing online in my online courses that I hope will be helpful. Um, so I'll dig into that. The, oh great, okay. So the first thing is um, there's this whole area of goals and objectives and competencies and um, you might call, you know, might call them other things as well, wherever you're at. And that's a whole huge topic of in its own, uh, in its own right. And we really don't necessarily have a whole lot of time to go into that. But I do want to get you at least, and you may not have a whole lot of time to think about these as you're rushing online, but at least keep in the back of your mind that keeping some type of alignment between whatever your goals or objectives or standards or whatever you call them are, and your content activities and your assessment is very crucial, especially when you go online. Uh, this is difficult when you're switching from face-to-face -face online because it often exposes the place where your alignment is lacking in pre-existing materials. And what I mean by that is that when I've worked in the past with professors to help them move their courses online, uh, we often found places uh, sometimes after the course had gone live to where they're actually testing things that they had written into the test material, but they um, uh, didn't realize that it was just 
something that they had. Someone's editing my slides. That's cool. Um, that I did tell us off. That's pretty cool. I can do that. Um, but where um, it exposes the places where they may have gone off on tangents or side trails and hadn't included it in their materials, or maybe the other way where they had talked about some things and then didn't test it, or hadn't maybe talked about it in their goals, but because of the um, kind of uh, you know rolling nature of face-to-face -face courses, we're constantly updating them each week. Uh, they they did know that there wasn't an alignment between what they were testing, what they were teaching, what their goals were. So when you go online, you do want to become aware of these. Um, like I said, this uh, entire course could be taught on this topic, but the main idea here is to clearly state what you want to happen in your goals, objectives, what they are. Uh, then stick with teaching that in your content activities and then for however you assess or grade your courses or ungrade or pass or fail or whatever it is make sure that you stick with those two uh, stick with what your goal your objective was and what you taught um I, I, early last year i actually uh, noticed that some of my students that i was teaching were kind of struggling with the difference between goals and objectives and competencies so i made a series of videos and there's a playlist for them that goes through that in a little bit more detail uh, it's not a credible deep dive, but hopefully it, if you want to look into this topic more, you can. Now we've been talking about, um, um, uh, this week we've been looking at things like active learning and experiential learning and problem-based learning. So I wanna look at one assessment technique, and I know other people in this class like Justin have experience with this as well, uh, that, are, that we commonly refer to as assignment bank. Um, and what I'm meaning by this is that when you move online, you, you lose a lot of the control of the course environment that you're used to having in the classroom. You're used to your students being there. Uh, you're used to knowing what kind of internet connection you have. After a few class meetings, you have an idea of what devices they have. Uh, and you can also uh, have the ability to bring in things. Uh, you know, you can bring in a box of newspapers for people to dig through whatever, whatever your assignment is. But going online, you lose a lot of that, and especially now, <laughs> what we're dealing with now. I mean, we were just dealing with, you know, Tanya was, you could probably talk about this, how all of a sudden there's this order of lockdown or quarantine, she wasn't sure for a while. And our students are gonna be in that same thing where they're also losing a lot of control that could just change from day to day. So we're not only dealing with the normal loss of control that going online comes with, if you weren't aware of that, then surprise. Um, but we're also dealing with uh, this whole big societal thing that's losing control even more. So because students will be in these different contexts with differences in text, differences in the real life access to things, you kind of have to think of assessment in a more flexible way because they may not um, have access to, say, if you're wanting to grade a term paper, but what if the library website goes down? Those kind of things due to the stress and the strain of the internet. Because we're seeing articles today about the internet showing stress and strain. And I don't know if you know this, but Netflix and Spotify and these places are coming back on the ability, our ability to stream our entertainment even. So because of all the strains on the internet, so. Um, so we have to take the, we have to take, we're probably going to have to take an even greater measure of flexibility uh, in our assessments than even has been the norm for online learning up until now. So um, one way to build flexibility for you and your students is through these things that we call assignment banks. And basically what this is, instead of you telling the students how they're going to prove to you that they learned something and how you're going to assess them, it's like, okay, we're all doing this paper. We're all creating this website. This is our assignment. You, deter you have the students determine that how aspect of how they're going to prove it to you that they learn what they were supposed to learn for the week. This is a strategy that allows students to get creative about the coursework while being able to personalize it more meaningful to them. And what I'm meaning by this is uh, you don't necessarily have one product they turn in. I think I've been touching on this, but uh, it could be not just a paper, it could be a video that they create, it could be a 
pictograph that they draw. It could be an interpretive dance. It could be lots of things. Uh, I think Justin had someone do uh, a comic book and uh, a stop motion Lego video to, 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 to prove what they had learned about history because he's a history professor as well. This kind of combines experiential learning, active learning, possibly even problem solving if you put it in there and personalized learning. I realize it's a buzzword soup, but again, if you start using this as well, whenever your evaluations come, your administrators will love to hear all these buzzwords because they really love those. So an assignment bank and structure is uh, basically, it is, um, uh, it, it is what it says it is, assignments, a bank of assignments. You could call them activities, you could call them a project bank, and you can call it different things. But the main thing you wanna do is think through the question and concerns of students. Don't just throw some directions at them and leave it at that. Don't just spend five minutes putting it together and leave it at that. Um, the bank part of this is a list of example projects to do. Don't assume that they always have ideas. And so what I mean by this is that an assignment bank is kind of a pre-list of ideas that you could give to the students for how they could finish the assignment or how they could complete the assignment. And the way you look at it is that the learners can choose to follow your ideas, they can choose to modify your ideas, or they can choose to create their own ideas in this. Um, we'll get to that one in a minute. So, um, and this is one way if you have your learners um, give them some flexibility over what they can choose to do. This gives them the ability to deal with the life and all the things that are going uh, kind of weird around them and, and deal with even their own technology needs to come up with a way to show you that they learn what they learn. Uh, also, you will not want to consider some kind of assignment hub of some kind, you know, discussion board or something so that the students can share what they're working on with each other. Um, and as we talked about in earlier classes as well, um, you know, the question for a lot of it, for a lot of these assignments is, you know, how do we get these students, how do we get it so the students aren't answering or creating all the same project and doing the same thing over and over and over again. And the answer to that that we came up with in the last session was make sure that you come up with a problem or assignment instructions that um, is, is something that would be different for each student. Don't just have them answering rote, you know, questions that would be the same for everyone in there. Um, but I would also say be ready for your learners to look at something like this with suspicion. They're not used to this. Uh, they're you're probably used to being told specifically what to do and how to do it. Um, but you will want to maybe give them some scaffolding steps to assure them uh, that they can do this and you really want them to do this if, if you do go this, this route. Um, we have some examples of, of what an assignment bank could look like. Uh, this one right here, I'm not sure if I click on this, if you'll still see it or not, but um, can everyone still see the screen with the website coming up? No, I think when in Zoom, the way it's set up here, it keeps yeah. on the Google or on the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so these are some examples. These will be in the materials. Uh, one's a massive assignment bank uh, that has been up for years with hundreds of examples. And this one, uh, the top one here is actually one where students could submit their own ideas that other students could then use it as they wanted to. Uh, the second one is one that we did in, the, in another class that I taught a few years ago uh, where we put more activities together for people to use as a bank. And then the third one is uh, one where we collected um, a lot of the learners work together into an activity hub. Uh, and then when you look at that, we see uh, when you can get to these links, that is actually a list of all the things that, this, that the learners did while they were, um, uh, while they're working in the course. So the problem with this, of course, comes with this idea of how do you grade this? And so that's something I want to cover in general in grading online. This doesn't have to apply to assignment banks. This can apply to other assignments. But what I found a bit more successful in online education is uh, uh, we start doing these problem, these projects, problem-based learning, active learning, those kind of things. Uh, people start switching to rubrics to grade these. Some people hate rubrics. Some people love rubrics. Some people could care less about rubrics. 
I found that if your rubrics are a bit more open nature, they do work better in online learning, at least for me. And what I mean by that is that your stereotypical rubric looks like what you see here on the screen. Where there's all these uh, specific point values uh, applied to specific levels, and you have to figure out where the students work on each part of this grid and where it goes in there. And for me, those become very time consuming and very overbearing and still kind of very subjective. Because if you look at this, I mean, what really is the difference between a good understanding of the material and an excellent understanding of the material. So, so I do find rubrics to be a bit on the subjective side, but um, even when they look like this, I know these were uh, rubrics like this are an attempt to bring some uh, quantitative uh, focus to rubrics. But students can look at this and sometimes feel like their work is just reduced to a bunch of checkpoints on a grid and still not really know how well they did on the assignment. So I, I, in my classes, um, take on more of something like this, more of an open-ended rubric uh, approach to grading in courses, because this focuses more on this focuses more on why they got a grade instead of just the grade itself. And what I mean by this is that I have kind of general areas, you know, the issue question, the organization, validity of argument. Doesn't necessarily focus as much on the technical skills and things because. Uh, again, that's not really what I'm testing in the course, but it kind of focuses on how did they prove that they know what they know. And so you see there's just kind of a wide area and a wide range of points that, that can be utilized there. And that's generally what I do is we'll type out some feedback uh, there on each one of those areas that go down the rubric for the students. Um, and this is kind of the way I look at it. Uh, it's kind of turning the grade more into an interactive thing where they get that feedback that they wouldn't necessarily, that they sometimes get in face-to-face -face course where they can come ask you about, well, why did this happen? Or even before it, they can come ask you, well, what do I do about this? And when I start, when I use rubrics like this in my courses, it, it kind of uh, in some way mimics, some way replaces that face-to-face uh, -face interaction uh, that it sometimes goes missing when you go online. Um, and like I said, there, this could also be used, uh, George was talking about the ungrading and the pass-fail uh, pass movements that are happening. Um, so you could also just take the grade points off this and use this as just a feedback sheet on the work if you're in one of those scenarios. Um, and actually, uh, I do have, I grabbed it just right before the session started, I have a, a rubric that I use in class and I'll put it in the, the course uh, materials that you can look at. Uh, and you can see how I do on the rubrics, a full rubric for me if you want to look at it. But even going a bit more broader than that, uh, for general grading tips, um, and before this, I think this is about done, but uh, I just also, also want to cover a few general grading tips that have helped me when I'm on online learning. Uh, first of all, the one we've, we've been hitting on a lot is thinking outside the multiple choice box. Your students are going to get a lot of multiple choice tests. I mean, we're, we're working with faculty all day this week, all day, every day this week about their questions and they're constantly asking about tests and questions and multiple choice and browser, uh, lockdown browsers and proctoring tools and all that. And I'm just telling you, your students are going to be overwhelmed with those high stakes uh, standardized tests that are mostly multiple choice questions. And so if you could think outside of that box in any way, uh, your students would probably love you for it. Just something maybe that gets them to work on something more experiential, more applicable to their lives, more just off the computer even. Um, and we also heard from our students who were here a couple of days ago. They kind of said a lot of the same things here. They, they're, they're tired of these, uh, they're getting tired of these uh, really rote answer things. And we're also seeing, I saw a lot of reports today about these proctoring services that are claiming that everything's going great with their, with their testing services. It's not. They are straining. And the students are finding ways around it, you know, and, and students find ways if you, you know, students find ways around how to, you know, cheat in your face safe courses as well. It's going to happen online too, but um, the, you know, all these proctoring services, um, Anyway, there's a lot I could say there, but it's, it's just not looking good for those. Um, something that I do a lot in my class is I encourage my students to turn in their work to me early before the due date in, in time for me to go over and get it back to them so I can give them feedback. And this does a couple of things. 
one of the things it does is that it helps me spread out the grading load a bit. Because if they can turn the assignment or the paper or the project into me early, I give them feedback on it. Then when it comes to grading it, I, I'm really just looking for what did they change based on my feedback. And it goes a lot faster for me when I do that. What I have found though is that for some reason, if I just tell my students to give me, my, give me their projects for feedback, a few of them will, most of them won't. won't. If I call it free feedback, all of a sudden, a lot more of them turned into me. I don't know why. They just do. But, you know, it's, I mean, they still pay for the course. It's not really free. And it's not any more or less free than it would have been the other way. But for some reason, that word free just encourages the students to, more students to turn it in. I don't know what it is, but I know that every semester, if I say free, I get a lot more people turning it in. Now, as far as quizzes, multiple choice quizzes, I'm not saying that there's no place for them. I've just found that, uh, they work a little bit better as knowledge checks. Uh, basically, uh, quick five to 10 questions. I think I mentioned this on Monday, uh, where you give them unlimited tests and you just cover the stuff. This is the stuff I wanted you to learn. No tricks, no gimmicks, no gotcha answers, anything. These are just questions. Take them as many times as you want. And this will uh, show you what I'm hoping that you learn. And I think that to some degree works as long as it's low, uh, low stakes on that. They can take it as many times as they want to to get 100 or whatever. Uh, and I've also found that students will come back and take the test again, even after they got 100, if they run into something they're not sure of, like, oh, I think that was on that test, right? that uh, knowledge check quiz there. Um, some of those things can help students kind of, uh, especially in these, they're not certain they're new to you, new to online they're new to you being online because they've never been with you online before can kind of maybe help them uh give them a sense of what you're what you're hoping they come away from the course with and then if possible uh consider ungrading there's kind of a move for this um or the pass fail pass revise i hate the word fail so i usually use pass revise myself. Um, there, there, there's a lot of resources out there and I realize some of you like myself, I can't do ungrading where I'm an adjunct at because I have to turn in a grade. Um, but where you have that power to do that, the ungrading process, uh, there's been a lot of people who've worked on that and researched that and it becomes this way of what I've been covering all along is having to turn the grades into more of a conversation rather than just a gotcha system of trying to, to figure out who you can, uh, you know, who you can rank in your course according to their grades and those kind of things. Uh, but probably what we'll see more realistically is uh, if the pass fail uh, stuff or pass revise, uh, or if, if, people, if we do get people to reconsider grading, that it'll probably be the pass fail or pass revise that will probably uh, be um, something that will be more uh, acceptable to administrators. Uh, I tend to look at my discussion grades and interaction grades uh, that the people like to put in classes is more pass revised than score based as well. Uh, that just that helps me just kind of uh, move students through the process of learning how to interact without having to fret over specific point values for each discussion post that they do as well. So that was uh, when probably longer than I should have, but that was a really quick and very incomplete look at grades. So I will now um, pass it over. I think I saw some questions popping up, but couldn't look at them, so. Sure, uh, thanks, Matt, for that. I think that's a great overview of a number of, of approaches and ways that you can deal with assessment and evaluation. I think in particular, the difficulty here is that online environments often are not less impactful for assessment than an in-person in environment. What I mean with that awkwardly phrased statement is that you think you can save some efficiencies by moving online with certain kinds of testing and so on, and yet you often don't end up with those efficiencies being realized because you take more time and effort to evaluate what you're doing rather than here's a, you know, here's a test that can be scored automatically or here's some other approach that you're using for for assessing your students. So how do you deal with the time constraints? Because if the quality of assessment online can actually be better than, it, than an in-person class in some ways, 
then how do you deal with this idea of even like the free assessment point that you mentioned? This is all extra work mm -hmm. for you as an instructor. And let's say you've got 100 students or 200 students in your course. That can get to be pretty overwhelming. Now, I know you mentioned you're not against the idea of assessments through quizzes or online uh, you know, proctored exams. But do you want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the workload component of it and how you manage that? Yeah. Well, the, the free feedback thing was actually a thing that I did to deal with the workload because I found that it spread it out, you know, instead of it all being concentrated, here's your deadline, everyone turns it in, I have to grade 100 papers. That starting at that point, I started getting, you know, 20% of the students turning it in. And, you know, I, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at telling them to turn these things in two, three weeks out before the deadline, as soon as they can get a rough draft. And then you start seeing kind of the, the students that are the high achieving, you know, early workers start doing that. And then the ones that, you know, get closer and closer to the wire, some more. Like I said, once you've given them feedback uh, on those assessments, then that saves you time grading those specific papers after the deadline. Um, another thing that uh, I also look at is that, um, you know, I, I see a lot of people forming these grading schemes and rubrics and they're just, very long and very complicated, very detailed and multiple points. And you got to get your, you know, you got to get your complex algebra out to figure out what your grades are going to be because they're so complex. And, and that, you know, and they, they try to just jump into online, their first online course with all this stuff. And I'm like that, you know, that's just going to, um, that's just going to add to your time because you're going to have to figure out those grades. You're going to have to fill out those rubrics as well. Uh, that's why in my rubrics, I keep it to four or five areas and then stick with the feedback in those as well. Because a lot of times the, the workload that we put on ourselves, just trying to give all this detailed, uh, you know, breaking things down quantitatively gets very, very heavy. And we, we're not going to have time for that. Maybe, you know, as we get used to being online, you can work some more of that in. But for now, uh, you know, try to make something that focuses in really on the core of what you're trying to teach and make it to where you can actually give feedback and you're not, you know, writing uh, your own term paper for every single student back to them. Uh, thanks for, for the comments or reflections on that. Regarding the, the questions in the forum, it was more of a conversation that was going on. And I think Tanya and uh, Negan and Justin addressed many of the comments there. There was some focus on audio feedback as a way of giving, you know, some more focused direction to students. Uh, there was also the question of rubrics and individual rubrics and so on. And how do you manage that? And the list goes on. So if you get a second, feel free to dive in and do a quick read while I switch over to, to, to Tanya. But it looks like most of the, the comments that were, were made have already been addressed or answered. Um, Tanya, over to you. Not sure if you need permission to share slides. Um, you are a co-host. I think I have it. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Which one are we on? All right. So just a, a little bit of sort of experience reflecting on what you all are going through. These presentations I've traditionally given in the face-to-face -face setting with faculty. So I used to lead the faculty development program. Um, these sessions used to be give or take about an hour. There'd be some presentation, answering questions, um, incorporated with activities. So it's new for me as well to take some of these presentations and try to turn them into brief 10-minute um, synchronous live presentations with you all that then later we will go into a deeper dive asynchronously. So I'm definitely feeling um, some of the challenges that you all have as you are taking your face-to-face -face information and trying to condense it down. The reason that we try to keep things at around 10 minutes is because we know from the research that presentations and lectures and those sorts of things should be chunked down because of um, our ability cognitively to sort of soak up that learning and, and anything longer is a bit of a challenge. So um, I'm gonna jump into my presentation here. I'm going to be bringing it back from what Matt was talking about. We cover a lot of the same things, which is great because we're from different institutions and have not collaborated previously before on faculty development. Um, and so you'll know that those are the really important points here. 
So I talked about on day one, and, um, and we revisit this often, about um, some different things that we should focus on right off the jump. So it was supporting students, redesigning your course and delivering content. And now we are talking more about the other side of this on assessing students and evaluating your course. And, um, and some of that walk falls into work, managing workload or workload considerations as well, but I'm not gonna touch on those today. So I just want to briefly talk about these main two, um, assessing your students and evaluating your course. And I wanted to, before I even get talking, um, I am a, you know, I'm a social scientist from the field of communication. I'm a senior scientist at my university now. Um, I run, run an R&D arm. I run a national research center, but I used to do faculty development, but I don't, um, I'm not from the field of education. Um, so I don't have extensive experience with the theory and terminology. So for me, sometimes it helps to um, use simple words, or maybe it's just me. So when I talk about assessing students, just so that we're all on the same page, um, I usually talk about how you're determining whether or not your students learned. And when I'm talking about evaluation, I'm talking about how do you evaluate your course? So how are you determining how you can improve your course? So just as I give this you know, brief um, presentation here today, just to give you an idea of that. Let me just note the time so that I stay on pace here. So on Monday, I talked a little bit about Wiggins and McTeague backwards design. I believe their book is actually on Google Books, so you don't need to purchase their book or secure it. You can actually access parts of it right online. And there's tons of stuff just on um, Google on different websites that you can access. And Matt had just alluded to this as well again, you know, really, when we're talking about assessment, you know, we have our learning objectives, you know, what we want our students to be able to accomplish by the end of the semester. And now we're sort of thinking about, okay, so how do we assess um, if they're able to do that? You know, have they learned what they needed to learn? Are they able to produce some sort of acceptable evidence? And, and what am I going to um, accept as um, evidence that they've actually accomplished these things? So I think it's really important, again, to just take a step back and think about this. I know a lot of times we're thinking about, should I use discussions? Should I use the Dropbox? Should I use different, you know, quizzing? Um, and sometimes it's like, let's just rethink this, especially to, I know some folks, I just talked to the University of Central Florida and they had to go on, you know, remote in three days. I know at my university, we're a little bit more lucky because we have a couple of weeks, although as we were just mentioning, we're all going through a lot of changes right now. And I just was getting word that we might be in a shelter in place and I was trying to grab resources and so forth. And our students and ourselves are going to be going through these same things in the next few weeks. I'm also not feeling well. So anyways, be very forgiving of yourself um, and your students and use those three C's that George is always talking about that I can't remember, but Kara's in there. <laughs> All right, so I just really, um, I could talk about assessment. Matt went far more in detail with it, which is great. We are actually in the upcoming weeks going to get in much more detail, but it's good to just get you started in thinking about it. Again, just reemphasizing, making sure that your learning objectives are measurable. When I was in communication, I remember my first course was like, you will understand the human um, nature of communication. And I was like, how do you measure that? That's really interesting. Um, so, you know, sometimes you might have to rewrite some of your learning objectives, but just think about aligning that. Matt already touched on moving beyond exams. As somebody who used to be a psychometrician, I can very much understand the value of multiple choice items and measurements, but I think that in online learning, there are lots of forms of low stakes frequent feedback that are better for learning um, than just traditional forms of cognitive assessment like multiple choice questions. I really like Angelo and Cross's um, classroom assessment techniques, CATS, not like the friendly kind in your lap. Um, their book is from 1990. Um, and so again, I think that's on Google Books. You can look it up online, but there's tons of different activities that you can do to check in on your students to find out if they're learning or not, or provide them with reflective activities, uh, potentially with some emotional attachment, think their think pair share activities. So there's lots of things you can move beyond exams. I also do a lot of group and team-based learning. 
um, for my students because I know that aligns with one, my um, disciplinary area that I teach, which is primarily communication technology groups or organizational communication. And so um, there's lots of, uh, you know, as George talked about yesterday, some experiential things as well. So I usually use quizzes just as Matt had alluded to. So if I have students do reading or watching some lectures, mine or ones I've curated on YouTube from like Anthony Giddens, it's funny how I would give lectures, but now YouTube has the person who wrote the theory actually giving the lecture. So no need for me to give it. Um, but I have those quizzes just to make sure that, um, you know, people are doing um, the reading and those sorts of things. And they help me identify what they did and didn't learn so that I can take time in the discussions to address what I call the weaknesses in their learning. So that in that way, it's just one way that online is so much better to me than face to face because I feel like I'm just looking at a lot of blank faces and hopefully people talk and speak up. But online, I actually can get data and know what they do and don't understand. And sometimes there's things I've taught for years and had no idea the students didn't know what I was talking about, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the research that we're doing at the Data Research Center, and I included earlier, and it's included on the research page, is an article I think that we did. And one of the really big things that came out of that around assessment was making sure that you are providing clear um, grading and expectations to your students. So, um, very much, you know, how are they being graded? What's expected of them? They don't want to be tricked into, you know, guessing what you wanted from them out of an assignment. So, and when you're online, you don't really have that face-to-face -face time to answer questions and introduce an assignment to them and so forth. So again, assessment is really about unpacking those different things for your students so that it's not a game for them. There's really, I like to call it ease of learning. Um, that there's no hurdles for them to learn, that they know what they're supposed to do and they're able to go and do it and produce evidence for you. Um, Matt talked about rubrics. There's a couple reasons why I'm an advocate of rubric. Early on, I was like, what are these? Why do we use them? And I'm so confused. I have no idea how to create one. Um, I found rubrics really useful and in our research indicated this as well because rubrics really help identify guidelines um, for students as far as their performance. It's a great tool to help manage your expectations for students or unpack your expectations, especially when you're online. So I think they're really great. They also help you manage your workload. As I mentioned yesterday, um, when I shared my rubric, is I actually have, I've redone my rubric, it's very personal now, where I can actually take statements out of it. I call them need, like I need you to do this. It was all the years of teaching conflict, I think, but. I need you to do this and I can paste that into the LMS and to the qualitative comments so that they more specifically know what they need to do. Um, the other thing is the scaffolding. So if you have bigger assignments um, online, whether it's a group based or individual based project, and I tend to have both. Um, and usually what I do is every week or bi-weekly, I chunk down those larger assignments so that students are getting feedback on every different piece of it. So by scaffolding their learning, I'm able to give them feedback as the course goes on. And it's quite, um, it's not automated, but it's quite efficient because they're able to submit it online. I'm able to provide feedback online, things that we don't necessarily do face to face. And at the end of the day, um, I find that I see a lot better projects coming in for my student groups and my students as individuals because I was able to do this. So those are just, um, you know, I just wanted to provide you with some key considerations that I felt from my research and practice and some of the literature out there of what you want to be thinking about as you rethink your assessment here, um, moving through to the final weeks of your course or in planning for your summer or fall courses. The next thing I briefly want to talk about here in my final minutes is the evaluation or evaluating your course. And so again, um, evaluation is determining how to improve your course. I firmly believe that evaluation is something that happens through the life cycle of your course. At the bottom of your screen here um, is a link to the course evaluation checklist. And I should mention I have an uh, assessment um, plan checklist that I included there as well. This one is um, an oldie but a goodie, but what I use this before previously in faculty development um, is 
And I developed this years and years ago from um, some of the Cal State University Chico from Quality Matters. I've later turned this into an instrument and done some research with it um, and student um, perceptions of the course. Um, but what I used this to do in the beginning, and a lot of you guys can do this over the weekend, is you can take the course evaluation checklist and you can check the things that you want to make a priority. Um, so what are the things, you know, put a one if you really need to make it happen, you know, a two if you'd like to, and a three if there's no way it's going to happen this semester. Um, and that way you have an idea of the different things that you might need to do in your online course. And then also you've sort of prioritized what you want to do with those moving forward. And so um, that's sort of the life cycle. Like you can start evaluating your course before um, the online versions even launched. Um, you can evaluate it while it's taking place. I love doing um, some things in the, you know, after the first week is asking students what's one thing you really like and what's one thing you'd like to improve um, because this should be an opportunity for you again as I said earlier to you know you're in this with your students and let's try to make the best um, out of it so you can continually improve it don't look at your courses this is something you have to have done ready to go well structured and in stone by the time you uh, pivot online and start your remote teaching but something that um, will be a little bit more um, iterative. It's very important that the students are, have a voice right now because like um, everyone has talked about, there's a lot of lack of control. And so the fact that they can provide you feedback on things that they like and are going well and things that are not, I really appreciate that. I usually put this in an open discussion forum where, and it's not anonymous because I think people should always be responsible for their comments. Um, but usually I take all of those comments. It's great because you'll see you know, if 80% of your students are like, this is too much work, you know, I'm sort of, well, the old me was like, suck it up. Now I'm like, oh, whoops, care, empathy. Okay. So, um, you know, what you could do is you're going to see it over and over, the higher frequency of the comment, comment you're going to know it's something that you should be improving. But getting that feedback from your students actually is going to increase their involvement of the course. They actually feel like they are part of the creation of this course and it's going to increase their satisfaction. We actually have some data on that. The other thing is all of this, um, all of this planning that you're doing with an evaluation checklist and with these different criteria and all of those sorts of things aren't just for right now, but they're going to help you deliver your course potentially online when it comes to summer or the fall semester. So you can very much, um, I always, you know, it's just like, you know, you get data, you get feedback, you have a plan for what you're going to do next with that data and feedback. So just keep that in mind. As you're evaluating your course, it's going to be all of those areas we talked about. So if you see on the checklist, um, and you'll know from the study that Rachel Casadas and I published in December in the Online Learning Journal, um, design of your course and organization, that backwards design that Matt and I have been um, talking about, or Matt's been talking about that alignment, that's like 75% in the regression analysis, predictor of student outcomes. So just keep that in mind. Other things as far as supporting students by content, I don't mean um, turning your lectures into audio lectures online or recorded lectures. Um, there are more specific strategies there that we're talking about that we talk about in the article, and it's more richness um, and context and, and those sorts of things. But anyways, these are some areas that you'll be looking at and evaluating your course that you can start over the weekend and identifying what are some priorities as you um, pivot online. And so um, we will make sure that these slides are available for you online. Um, and um, all of the resources that I've mentioned are in the slides and will be included as well for you all. And so um, with that, I know there were some chats going, I by no means was paying attention to them, but um, I will turn it back over to you, George. Hey, thanks very much, uh, Tanya. <laughs> uh, you know, really helpful group of uh, both frameworks and also practical templates and resources. And you'll find as we're going through for all of you uh, who are involved in the course that we want to progressively provide sort of more practical next steps and practical resources and that sometimes means that it is a template that you can use and revise it's a resource that you can adapt to online it's something that we haven't talked about a lot is that we haven't focused on 
the range of open educational resources that you can assess as well. The term has come up several times and we'll talk about a little bit more as we go, but there are things available online that are free and openly licensed that you can drop in and play around with and try and make sense of. So I think there's some good opportunities that way. One of the things I just want to emphasize, which came up in the forum as well, we are seeing this problem, if you will, uh, or this situation that we're currently, and I guess it's technically more than a problem, but the situation that we're, in, we're seeing it from a twofold perspective, the way we've articulated in the course so far. One is your house is on fire. Now is not the time to remodel the bathroom. Uh, now is the time to basically deal with the situation that's right in front of you as best you can. And then once you've extinguished the flames, to use that metaphor, uh, you can refocus on remodeling and improving what you need to do. But for many of you, we are dealing with a situation that is extremely atypical. And that requires that our efforts be focused on doing the best we can with the resources that we have available. Some of you may just say, I am going to send out a daily email to all of my students saying, read this chapter in the text or do this here. That may be all that you're capable of doing for the duration of this semester. And if that's what you're capable of doing, that's enough. Some of you may have a little more time to do some uh, synchronous sessions such as Zoom or Teams or Skype or whatever you want to do, great, do that. Some of you may be able to reuse existing assessment practices that you have, and that's going to be just fine. Others may say, I've got to assess my students, but it was done differently. You may need to get creative with video or audio recording, or maybe it's just you revert and say, all right, I'm going to have you write a paper and I'll mark the, or you know, grade the papers. What I'm trying to get at here is getting through the next two months is a different type of a scenario than making longer term changes to being online. I fully expect that we will still be largely in a digital environment come September. Things will then give you an opportunity over the next few months to be more intentional and more structured, you know, your bathroom renovations type of framework that I talked about earlier. So I just want to make sure that, that people who are here, you know, at least recognize that that's a twofold way of seeing the current landscape. Now, with that said, um, I think there's some uh, interesting uh, opportunities that have been shared by both Tanya and Matt uh, around how you might want to assess, how you might want to engage, and how you might want to begin moving toward the digital environment. What I'm going to do now is maybe ask Justin and Nagin just for any reflections on the assessment and the evaluation end of it, because both of you obviously have done a lot of both design and testing and evaluation online. What would you follow up with some of the, the points or the suggestions that have already been shared? Um, sure, I'm happy to go first. Um, <clears throat> so on the evaluation end, um, I often find that um, evaluation is done at the very end. Um, and I think that when you're, that whole, um, learning design life cycle, and Tanya was um, touching in on that from the various steps in it. You need to start thinking about evaluation pretty early on. Like, what is it that you actually want to evaluate in your course design? And it doesn't have to be everything, but it could just be the really um, simple thing. So in this current climate, you're pivoting online. It could be as simple as, you know, did your students, um, were they able to access your content? Were they able to have some interaction with you and with one another? You can keep it, keep those questions pretty simple. It doesn't have to be overly sophisticated. And then looking at, well, what sort of data can you use in order to be able to answer those questions? Um, so I, Tanya mentioned it in her presentation. If it's online, you can, um, get a sense of how students are faring, like the little questions that you might ask them, like little multiple choice self-check questions, for examples, that you might put in. You can then go in and see, well, how many students actually did that self-check? How, how did they do? Did most students um, have difficulty with a particular concept? And then you might do a quick little video explaining that concept. Um, but those are those little feedback ways across the course to be able to get a sense of how your students are doing. You can build in little touch points in the course, again, to get that sort of feedback. Um, sometimes I ask my students just to tell, you know, three little questions, maybe after every couple of weeks. Um, what do you want more of? What do you want 
me to stop doing? Um, what do you want me to start doing? Um, and it can be set up um, anonymously in a form or, or whatever tool you want to use. And that way you're just getting little bits of feedback throughout the course um, and giving that control element back to the students to be able to share that feedback with you. And then at the end of the course, you can take all these different little data points, whether it's that um, feedback throughout the course, how students do on their assessments, how students um, engage with those self-check activities to see how the, how the course went. So it's all those different elements. I also think it's great to try to engage your colleagues, particularly now um, when we are, a lot of us are working remotely um, and it can be a little bit isolating and it's not as easy to um, engage a colleague. I think it's when it's really critical now is um, you know, contact a colleague and ask them to just look over your course or look over the video you made or any sort of thing. And that, that's that peer feedback element, which I think is just as important um, when you're evaluating as the student feedback as well. So just, yeah, a few little tips there. Yeah, Nadine, um, definitely, um, I want to echo a lot of things that you said. Um, I was definitely thinking about that, the formative um, elements, you know, and, and I think part of that also could be don't try to do too much too quickly as your uh, learners are going to um, be transitioning to the space and thinking about some of the load that they're having to deal with um, of having to completely learn new environments, new tools on top of everything else that's going on. So, um, you know, some things that are a little bit more manageable and bite-sized, uh, perhaps instead of big, long one-hour tests, um, doing some other things along the way might be able to um, help in terms of at least some of the flexibility and the care that we're talking about. All right, great. Well, um, let's see if there's any additional questions. I've just been following the forum here. There was a shout out from Peter Sands to uh, to Tanya for her awesomeness. So, woohoo! The uh, Negan gets a shout out for her backgrounds. So, there. You know, one of the things I find interesting too, and and I do want to emphasize this. This is a space that is marginally depersonalized but has its own character there are ways that for lack of a better word and i'm not saying that negan's trying to make the space fun but there are ways that you can make things personal there are things that you can do that help make it less oh look there's george's head on my computer screen again great another hour of this so i encourage you to do that like make the space yours as best you can play around with memes and discussion forums foster certain types of engagement and creativity and so on recognize students that are willing to try and make the space fun because at this point we're going to be here for at least a significant amount of time and that's not the easiest thing for us to be able to to articulate now the other thing is, is there's a, a few different questions being uh, shared around specifics of technology use one of the easiest ways to do that, I think, if you're able to, is go to edX and ask those specific questions in the discussion forum. That'll allow us a space to have not just us respond, but others as well. As you'll note, I'm not sure, no idea how many we have here, but let's say we have five or six or 700 people in the course. I think it's in that range. And that means that a lot of you have the expertise that someone else needs. And by making your request explicit in the discussion forums, there's opportunities for others to come by and answer that rather than just, you know, the four of us that are kind of, uh, you know, trying to, uh, is there four of us, five of us? I think five of us that are trying to coordinate the course. We, we really, in a networked environment, an online environment, a big part of your teaching strategy is to activate sort of the latent knowledge and capacity that exists within your courses and classrooms. So I'd encourage you for a lot of those kinds of technical questions, and maybe Justin, you and I can chat later about setting a sort of a forum for specifically technical practice kinds of questions that people have such as how do you do this in canvas and how do you do that and the list goes on so I think that's sure. a great opportunity to go yeah I think that sounds great all right now I need also as a question being an occupational therapy much we do is hands-on we do demos and practice but don't have time to hold individual testing right now I'm trying to figure out how they can demo vital science testing that's a great uh, point Anita one of the things that I've found in the past and this was years ago I was in Manitoba at the time there was a group there that did hairdressing and, and we developed an online course for that particular field this is like in 2002 2003 Skype was just very early stages and they actually did one-on-one -on -one testing or you would have students record a short video using any number of tools anybody who has facetime or has any 
mobile phone these days has video recording capabilities and they would actually have somebody record it or they record it themselves and they would post it uh, online. So there's a number of ways or approaches that people will try and get that kind of concept across. So there are simple approaches that you can still duplicate that. Now, if you require another human being, especially in time of social distance, that may make things a little bit harder to be able to communicate that. Uh, let's see, anything else? Someone else, okay, Tanya mentioned nursing programs are fully online. It is competency-based. Videos may help, so Henrietta addressed that already. Yeah, great to see. Great to see you all helping each other and asking, answering one another's questions. Uh, I think we're kind of at the end of our session here today. Next week, we want to start getting a little bit more practical. We won't necessarily do these weekly discussions, even though there have been a number of interviews that we've had with experts in the field over the last week and, and numerous coming. So each week there'll be about two to three, maybe four interviews with different researchers that can provide practical guidance. We're also going to, as I mentioned, bring in more of the, here's a template that you might want to do this with, just to give you a little bit more scaffolded guidance. But the rest of it is really important with these kinds of courses online is we also need you to share what you want to see. That's a great place in a discussion forum or even to email you know, any, of, any of us and just say, I'd like to learn more about this or can we talk about this because we do want to be responsive to you and what your interests and needs are. On that note, final thoughts, Matt and Tanya, before we wrap up. I, um, what thoughts do I have? <laughs> um, I think just to go back to where we said, just take a minute and take a breather and think about um, what is actually realistic to happen here by the end of the term. I think you'll find out there's lots of opportunities. I know it can be a little scary and nerve wracking, but I think that the online environment um, can actually provide lots of opportunities for you all. And so um, hopefully as we take a deep dive um, or a deeper dive moving forward, we can help you all with that. All right, well, I think, uh, Matt, if you have some concluding thoughts, I just saw your mic unmute. I did not really, but uh, good luck to everyone. Uh, um, also, the, you know, we had a lot of questions on how to take quizzes online because that's the fastest way to do that. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there online. Uh, feel free to make sure and uh, just search for those because people have uh, been grappling with these for decades in some cases, especially with Blackboard. Um, so, uh, so don't forget, you know, and, and all the craziness that sometimes you can, you know, Google. I, I've been forgetting that sometimes this week as well, but in the rush of things that I can just, I can just search for this. Oh, you know. So don't forget that too as well. Google is your friend or Bing or whatever your, your surveillance device of choice is. All right, great. Well, thanks everybody for spending time with us this week. And we are going to keep going. We'll do live sessions during uh, next week as well, just on a daily basis. We'll move a little bit more toward asynchronous. Take care. Make sure you carve out some time for your own sanity and your own uh, you know, mental wellness and recognize the challenges that your students face as well because they are almost guaranteed more disoriented and more overwhelmed than, than we all are. So a little bit of kindness goes a long way, uh, except to Serbians. Serbians as a rule are a cruel, cruel people. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the weekend. Talk later. <laughs>